Bonjour and welcome back to my World History course. This is Professor Philippe Girard. Last time we covered warfare in the Eastern Mediterranean, specifically the wars between Greece and Persia. Today we'll head to the western part of the Mediterranean Sea and cover the granddaddy of all these ancient civilizations, Rome. I've said it often, world history is a huge topic and the Roman Empire spanned a thousand years. So there's enough material there to spend a whole semester on this topic alone. So as is my wont, I will just give you a general primer on Roman history to set the stage and then zero in on just one issue I find interesting. And today that will be slavery. So let's start with the origins of Rome. According to Roman mythology, the city was founded in 753 BC. You probably have heard the story. It involved twin babies, Remus and Romulus, were nursed by a she-wolf and then had a falling out and killed each other. I have some doubt personally whether a she-wolf would nurse human babies, but that's a story that Romans like to tell. The scene became a symbol of their city and you can still find it on the football jerseys all the way to the present time. And historians would like to tell other stories which are less pretty but more accurate. And so archaeologists, uh, they have found remnants of a village in Rome going back to the 8th century BC, which roughly matches the legend. And there are reasons why the city would be founded there. It's alongside a river, as always, the Tiber River, which is not very big, but at this point in Rome, uh, there was a ford, a place where you could cross the river. So that was a natural spot for merchants to converge. Uh, there are also seven hills in the area, and that provided early Romans with spots where they could fortify or defend themselves. The main item of trade in the area was salt, which was a key staple in ancient times because that was used to preserve food uh, before the invention of canning and freezing. Salt was so commonplace, in fact, that it was often used as a currency. Soldiers were paid with a salarium, a bunch of salt, which is what has given us the word salary, a wage. So initially, Rome was ruled by kings, so this period is known as the monarchy. And the monarchical period uh, is really shrouded in mystery because it only goes so far back. So we don't know that much about it. What we do know about it is that in 509 BC it came to an end because the Romans overthrew the kings and set up a republic, a government without kings. And that regime, the republic, would last from 509 until 31 BC. The republic is much better known because this is when Rome conquered most of its neighbors. So we have accounts of those wars. Initially, Rome was no more than a small town, and so the region around it was the late Latium, where Latin comes from, and that's it. Uh, there were more advanced civilizations elsewhere in Italy, such as the Etruscans uh, to the north, or even further north in France, the Gauls. Uh, they were so powerful that they once were able to raid Rome. The people of Rome weren't particularly civilized in the sense of culture like the Greeks. In fact, they had a reputation for being rough and violent. Uh, there's a famous war early on in the history of Rome where the Romans began to abduct and rape the women of their neighbors, the so-called Sabines. And the Romans were pretty proud of that story. They saw themselves as the warlike people, rough, cruel even, but practical, loyal to the state, and courageous. And if that meant abusing or raping their neighbors, so be it. Another anecdote that says much about the Roman mindset involves Cincinnatus. Uh, he was a Roman farmer who lived at a time when Rome was threatened by a local rival. And in times of peril like this, Rome would set aside its republican form of government and appoint a dictator, a man who had absolute powers for six months, long enough to solve the military crisis and hopefully not turn into a tyrant at the end. Well, Cincinnati left his farm, took over the army, and just as he was told, he defeated the enemy in just two weeks. And then he could have ruled as a dictator for five and a half months, uh, but instead he resigned his command and went back to his farm. Romans loved to tell that tale because that showcased the moral virtues that they liked. Here was a simple man, Cincinnatus, willing to put the needs of the state above his own. So Cincinnatus was later an inspiration for George Washington, who also resigned his command after the American Revolution and also refused to be a king. And by the way, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, that is named after him. So by the 300s, Rome was in control of most of Italy south of the Po River. Their main rival by that point would be a city we've mentioned before, Carthage. And if you remember, 
uh, from Electra and Mesopotamia, Carthage had begun as a Phoenician settlement in Tunisia. We don't know that much about Carthage in large part because, spoiler alert, our history is written by the winners and the Romans were the winners. So we know them mostly from outside sources, Greek or Roman, uh, that are quite biased. So apparently the Carthaginians worshipped a god called Baal, B-A-A-L, who occasionally demanded child sacrifice, which the Romans found very cruel. The Romans were also known to kill their own kids, and they also practiced human sacrifice on occasion. The Carthaginians also crucified generals who had disgraced themselves in battle, and the Romans saw that this was really cruel. But then the Romans proceeded to borrow this torture, and they used it on a large scale against slaves and rebels. What we do know is that the Carthaginians were rich. Carthage was home to two bustling ports, one for warships and another one for merchant ships, just like the Phoenicians, they were good at trade. And that money allowed them to hire mercenaries for their own army, and that the Romans also found ridiculous, because Roman citizens were expected to fight their own wars, not hire mercenaries to fight them. Whatever the Carthaginians did, it worked. By the 300s, Carthage was a notable power that controlled much of North Africa, as well as the island of Sicily and Sardinia and I think Corsica. And that put them on a direct collision course with Rome that was pushing south from Italy. So Rome and Carthage fought three wars together, known as the Punic Wars, P-U-N-I-C. The first of those was fought around 250 BC over the island of Sicily, which stood at the juncture of the two growing empires. Just one problem, the war was fought over an island, and the Romans had no navy to speak of. But they figured, we're practical people, we're good engineers, how hard can it be to be a sailor? So they built a navy from scratch, faced the experienced Carthaginian sailors, and they lost. So they built another navy, and they lost again, and on, and on, and on. We often remember the Romans today as great soldiers and sailors, but their history was littered with a litany of defeats. What they had was tenacity. They kept going on. And the one battle that they always won, that was the last battle of the war. The Romans eventually designed a corvus, which was a giant hook attached to their trireme, supposed to look like a crow, a bird. And so instead of fighting a standard sea battle, they would use that corvus, a crow, to hook the enemy trireme and then their legionaries could board the enemy ship on a bridge, and that transformed the naval battle into a lane battle, for which the Romans were far better suited. So the Romans eventually gained ascendancy at sea, they blockaded the coast of Carthage, and they forced their enemy to sue for peace uh, when they ran out of cash. And that's how the First Punic War ended with a Roman victory, after all. So Carthage eventually recovered economically after the Punic War, in part because it took over Spain. Uh, where it exploited large silver mines, and that helped them finance a new fleet and a new army. And so with Carthage on the rise again, a second Punic War began. That's the most famous of the three because it involved Hannibal, usually cited as one of the three great military leaders of ancient times, alongside Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Rather than wait for the Romans to attack, Hannibal went straight on the offensive. So he walked all the way from Spain, through the southern part of France, and then across the Alps into Italy itself, especially at the great battle, the great victory of Hannibal called Cannae. But you know one thing about Romans, they never quit. So one of the generals, Fabius, decided to avoid major battles with Hannibal and instead kept running around and away from him in Italy. That kind of slow and decisive strategy has been called the Fabian strategy ever since, when you don't try to fix things uh, right away. So Fabius uh, bought enough time for the Romans to send yet another army, this time straight to Carthage itself, and that army forced Carthage to sue for peace, even though Hannibal in Italy had not been defeated ever. So that's the end of the Second Punic War. The third one was fought around 150 BC. Uh, Carthage had yet again recovered economically, so a Roman senator called Cato was afraid that they could be a threat again. So anytime Cato would do a speech in the Senate on whatever the topic was, taxes, education, sewage, whatever, he would end up by saying, Delenda est Carthago. By the way, Carthage must be destroyed, whatever the topic was. So his uh, fellow senators eventually uh, agreed to declare war, to shut him up, if nothing else, and Rome attacked Carthage uh, in the last time. 
and that last Punic War was uh, kind of a more one-sided affair uh, that ended with a Roman takeover of the city uh, that was brutal, even by their standards. Uh, the Romans killed most of the population of Carthage, uh, they enslaved the rest, and then raised the city to the ground, and then they sowed salt into the surrounding fields to make sure that the, the, the soil uh, would be sterile. And then, after committing that kind of genocide, they left. I remember visiting Tunisia as a child, and I was already a history buff by then, so uh, I was very excited to visit the ruins of the great city of Carthage, only to realize that only a few stones remain from that period, and that's when I remembered, oh yeah, the Romans won. By the first century BC, Rome had defeated every potential rival, not just Carthage, but Greece and Gaul, which is today's France as well. So victory brought its share of troubles, however, because Rome was no longer a monarchy, it was a republic. Uh, at the same time, it was not an egalitarian democracy either. Average Roman citizens, which were called the plebeians, could vote, but the system was designed so that the rich folk, the nobility, they were called the patricians, uh, they exercised most of the power. So it was more of an oligarchy, if you will. And inequality only worsened after the many wars of conquest. A general like Julius Caesar, who uh, uh, was the one who conquered Gaul, or modern-day France, he came back from there with an immense fortune in slaves and loot. About one million slaves were brought uh, from France, in addition to a million people that were killed during that conquest. Well, meanwhile, his soldiers got a pittance, and they struggled to readjust to civilian life after uh, they returned from Gaul. In fact, there were now so many slaves flocking into Rome after the wars of conquest that free Romans, average plebeians, uh, they struggled to find a job. How could they compete against people who were paid nothing, especially at a time when the patricians were buying up all the land for the farms? So that led to endless popular turmoil in the first century BC. Uh, and at the same time, ambitious generals like Caesar fought each other in a series of civil wars. I won't go into the details, uh, it's pretty complicated, so I'll just refer you to the HBO series Rome, which did a masterful job recreating the politics of late Republican Rome and the civil wars. And by the way, I would also recommend the book SPQR by Mary Beard, which is really insightful when it comes to the political culture of Rome. So the man who emerged victorious from this power struggle was not Caesar, who got uh, executed or murdered rather in 44 BC, uh, but a relative of his, Octavian, also known as Augustus the Great in Latin. And so by 31 BC, Augustus ditched most of the old Republican practices and became, for all, for all intents and purposes, the first emperor of Rome. So that began the last period of Roman history, the empire, which will last from 31 BC until the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in 40, uh, 476 AD. The first two centuries of the Christian era were the apex of the Roman Empire. Uh, they had defeated all their big enemies, so for, aside from occasional revolts inside, like say the Jewish revolt in 70 AD, the empire was generally at peace. This was called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome in Latin. So from Britain and the Danube in the north, all the way to the edge of Persia in the east, to the Sahara Desert in the south, to the Atlantic in the west, an empire of 100 million people lived in relative peace for centuries. This allowed Octavius, uh, Octavian sorry, slash Augustus and his successors to focus on architecture rather than war. And the Romans were great engineers, not just great soldiers. They may not have invented philosophy like the Greeks, but they invented mortar, cement, uh, which is just as useful in the long run. So they brought water from far away, for example, using massive aqueducts, like the one you can find at Pont du Gard in southern France today, so that the cities uh, would have plenty of water. Uh, then they built public baths, like the massive baths at Caracalla in Rome, or in the city of Bath in uh, England, or Trier in uh, Germany. Uh, they also built temples to the gods, like the Pantheon in Rome. They built giant stadiums for char chariot races, like the Circus Maximus in Rome, that could accommodate 300,000 spectators, so most of it has been destroyed now. Uh, they also built theaters to stage plays and great arenas like the Colosseum in Rome to stage gladiator fights. So I focused on the buildings in Rome, uh, but if you travel around the Mediterranean, 
uh, you will find plenty of Roman monuments built in towns uh, in Morocco, Libya, Germany, France, Turkey, and many of them are actually far more magnificent than the ones you can find in Rome because Rome was sacked many times, uh, so the buildings there are often in poor repair. So all these monuments were connected by an immense network of roads, uh, some of which are still in use today. Uh, there are also other legacies, such as the languages of Europe, like my uh, native language of French. Uh, these are Romance languages derived from Latin. Or another legacy would be the legal codes, uh, like right here in Louisiana. Uh, the laws are based on the Nipponic Code, which itself was based on the Roman legal code. Another legacy, the largest religion in the world today, Christianity, well, it emerged in the Roman Empire. So to quote the old Monty Python joke in the life of Brian, what did the Romans ever do to us? Well, nothing uh, except uh, clean water, road, education, law and order, peace, and on and on and on, and kill quite a few people. I don't want to idealize Rome too much because this empire came into being through war. It remained in existence through targeted acts of terror, and it based its economy on enslaved labor. And actually, let's shift to slavery uh, for the rest of this lecture. When Americans think of slavery, they think of cotton pickers in Alabama or Louisiana around 1850. Of course, that existed. Uh, Roman slavery shared some similarities with the American system, but there were also some major differences. For one thing, most Roman slaves were not black, and many were not employed in the fields. So how did you become a slave, exactly? Well, there were a lot of ways. Natural reproduction was one. Under Roman law, slavery was matrilineal. Children of female slaves were enslaved themselves. So theoretically, the slave population could have become self-sustaining in time if a slave woman had had enough children, except that this wasn't the case. So instead, a common way to expand the slave population in the late Republic was war. As Romans conquered Carthage or Gaul or Britain, they captured countless POWs by the millions and then enslaved them. And even during the Pax Romana, where technically there was peace, uh, there were skirmishes along the border with Scotland and Germany that brought a trickle of enslaved captives, uh, plus uh, local rebellions like the Great Jewish Rebellion. And during that time, Romans also purchased slaves from the realm uh, of the empire or outside the realm of the empire. A free person could also become a slave by legal means. Uh, you could be enslaved as a punishment for a crime. Uh, for example, one that's sent to a galley uh, or mine. Also in the Roman law, a father had extensive rights over his family. It was called the pater familia, uh, the father of the family. And that included the right to sell his own child as a slave if times got tough and he could not feed all of his offspring. And there were ex uh, examples of that that happened in history. Romans were also known to abandon their infants at birth in a kind of a crude form of birth control, child exposure, and especially if that child was female. Roman society was rather sexist. Uh, there's a letter, for example, uh, dated 1 BC that's from a husband to his wife. I think she was in Egypt. If it is male, let it live, the baby. If it is female, cast it out on the dung pile. Slave traders uh, would then rescue some of these infants who had been left to die of exposure and then raise them and then sell them as slaves when they were more marketable. So there were many ways that you could become a slave, and they were not connected necessarily to a race. There would be black slaves from Africa and also white slaves from, say, France today. There were also many ways that slaves could be employed as well. Some slaves could be employed on large farms, plantations, uh, just like in the antebellum South in the U.S. in the 19th century. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was no national debt or stock market per se in ancient Rome, so you couldn't invest in there if you had cash. And the easiest way for a rich men to invest his money uh, was to buy land and slaves and then profit off the crops. Uh, these large farms were called latifundia. And that's actually a problem for small Roman farmers that they would have to compete against those slaves and latifundia. That's why you had so many unemployed people in Rome. Uh, but slaves, beside farming, were employed in a bewildering number of ways. Uh, some of them would row on the triremes of the navy. Uh, some of them would mine salt and gold. Uh, they built monuments, uh, they served as cooks and maids in every rich household, and some even held high-level positions like tutor or accountant or foreman or engineer. Uh, you found slaves everywhere in Rome. Uh, the law of Rome condoned slavery, accepted it, 
and contains some provisions for the well-being of the slaves or even their manumission, which means their freedom. And freed slaves, after that, would wear kind of a special hat called a liberty cap so that you could tell them apart. There's a slave, a freedman, and a person that was born free. And that liberty cap for freedmen has remained a symbol of freedom ever since, especially in the 18th century Enlightenment. Uh, notice how people in the French Revolution often wore a liberty cap when they got rid of their king. And you also find that symbol in the icon iconography of 18th century Haiti, where you also had a major revolution, that's what I study, or in the US in the 18th century when you had the American uh, Revolution. But Roman law could also be quite cruel to slaves, uh, inflicting the old Carthaginian torture of crucifixion for those who dared to escape. I study slavery in a different context to that of Haiti, and what I have found is that the reality of slavery is often more twisted than what the law says. So you have to dig deeper than just the letter of the law. According to a story told by Tacitus, one first century Roman senator was once killed by his own slave. Apparently, both the master and the slave loved the same enslaved boy, so this was a crime of passion. As you can expect, the murderer was crucified, but also all 400 slaves in a household. The crime, if you can call it this way, was that they had not done enough to protect the master. So this story really shows how slavery involved many forms of exploitation, including sexual exploitation, and how it relied on widespread terror to endure, no matter what the law said. Let's zero in even further on one particular group of slaves, and that would be the gladiators. And I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, they were subject of a popular movie, whereas Russell Crowe a few, a few years back. What you may not know is that gladiators were slaves too. So where did the Romans get the sick idea of getting slaves, gladiators, to fight each other to the death? The practice, uh, interestingly enough, began as a religious ceremony in Munus, M-U-N-U-S. Sometime in the third century BC, a Roman aristocrat uh, asked three pairs of slaves to fight against each other right in the middle of a cemetery as a way to honor his uh, dead father, as if this was a human sacrifice that could help his dad enjoy eternal life. So the practice spread and then got so popular that crowds would flock to cemeteries to watch those slaves fight to the death. And so the bouts had to be moved to custom-made arenas and eventually uh, big ones like the Coliseum. Uh, but even there, uh, the fights were technically religious uh, still. They would begin with a ceremony to honor the God of the dead. And that's the reason why Christians could not technically attend the gladiator games, not because these were gruesome forms of spectacle, but because they were pagan rituals that Christians should not attend. Obviously, the practice spread not just because it was religious, but also because it was popular. Uh, the goal of the games ultimately was to entertain. As I mentioned before, in the late Republican era, Rome was racked by civil wars because there were so many unemployed people among the plebs. So the state responded by distributing free bread to the poor to feed them, much of it uh, imported from Egypt, and then staging entertainment uh, to keep all these people busy when they were unemployed. That was called panem et circenses, bread and games in Latin. So keep the populace fat and happy so that uh, they don't have time to complain. Or as we'd say today, give them Doritos and football. Authorities also saw the game as a kind of political theater, bringing POWs to Rome and then forcing them to fight for the pleasure of the crown but a powerful way to reenact past battles against the Gauls or the Carthaginians and then show the triumph of Rome. And that gruesome spectacle also sent a message to others, potential enemies. Romans, they were the kind of people who brought their kids to the Colosseum to watch people die dismembered uh, uh, by wild beasts. So the message was, don't mess with us, we are Romans. Most gladiators began as criminals and POWs, uh, but some men were so desperate in Rome, and the aura of the gladiators was so great, uh, that some free men voluntarily enslaved themselves so that they could be gladiators. Sure, you had to fight a few times a year, and you risk being killed, uh, but life was tough anyway, and as a gladiator, the women just loved you. There were even two emperors, Caligula and Commodus, who went into the arena to fight as gladiators, though one assumes that the bouts were rigged in their case. Organizing games, uh, that was a complex and expensive affair. 
uh, slaves had to be bought and then they had to be trained. And that was the job of entrepreneurs called lanistas, who owned schools in Capua, uh, where they would train the gladiators. That's just south of Rome. Then they would sell or rent their talent to anyone wanting to pay for a show. Uh, so the Lanistas essentially had a private army of their own that they had trained. And eventually, by the time you get to the imperial period, uh, these schools were eventually taken over by the state uh, for security reasons. Romans put a lot of thought into selecting the armament of gladiators. Too little armor and the outcome would be a brief bloodbath. That wasn't interesting. Too much and the fight would just go on forever. Uh, so gladiators wore three types of armor uh, to allow for interesting matchups. The Thracians, who were often recruited among Jews and Greeks in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, they fought with a short dagger with a tiny uh, round shield, and they had little armor. So the idea was that they would be swift and quick. The Reitiari, who were often of African origin, they fought with a trident and a net, like a fisherman. And then the Momeos, who were often from Germany or Gaul, Western Europe, uh, they fought with a sword and a shield. Uh, they were better protected, but also they were slumbering. The winner of the bout, uh, if he survived, uh, would receive some prize money and possibly freedom, while the loser might be spared or finished off, depending on the whims of the populace. The Romans devised variation on the same scene, always with the goal of getting rid of criminals and POWs in some entertaining fashions. So they brought exotic animals from all over, bears, elephants, rhinos, and then they would stage extensive hunts called venasios. I think it's the uh, origin of the term venison or they would use those wild animals to devour victims. It was called being executed at bestias, to the beast. And that was a humiliating way to die, which was often inflicted on Christians, for example, during the era of persecutions. In rare cases, engineers would flood the entire arena with water and then stage a mock naval battle, where hundreds of slaves reenacted the battles of Salamis, or Actium. These nomachians, they were called, uh, they were pretty rare and expensive stage. I think the first one was put together by Julius Caesar. As a historian, my job is to retrace the past in a neutral fashion, without passing moral judgment. And it can be hard sometimes. The idea of tying someone to a pole and then unleashing lions is obviously boring to me. But then I must admit that we're not completely past that stage in our society either. We still like to reenact civil war battles, albeit without bloodshed. Uh, we also like to stage symbolic wars between countries. We call that the Olympics. And people do enjoy watching grown male men uh, maul or even kill each other, whether it's in American football or the ultimate fighting championships. So maybe we're not completely that innocent after all, even in our modern civilized society. Let's get back to slavery. If the Romans treated the slaves so poorly, how could the slaves fight back? Well, the proper form of resistance, that's a question that slaves have faced since time immemorial uh, in Rome, but also elsewhere. Running away, uh, that was always an option, especially if, lived, if you lived far away from uh, Rome itself. Suicide was option number two, and that might seem self-defeating, but as a slave, your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to somebody else. So suicide is like sabotage, it's like destroying your master's property. And there are several stories of gladiators who strangled each other right before fight in order to deny the crowd the pleasure of watching them die. Revolt was the most extreme form of resistance and also the rarest. We know of three large revolts in Rome, one around 130 BC, one around 100 BC, and one around 70 BC. And notice how they all took place in the late Republican era when there was a huge influx of slaves into the empires and they all took part, uh, place 30 years apart. It's as if uh, each new generation of slaves brought into an empire wanted to revolt and then had to be taught a lesson. Uh, those revolts all took place in southern Italy and Sicily, where many rich Romans had acquired large absentee estates, the Latifundia, and so absentee capitalism uh, may also have been a causal factor. The most famous of these revolts was the Third Servile War. It's called the Spartacus Slave Revolt in 73 to 71 BC. We know fairly little about Spartacus, unfortunately, because he was just a slave and history is written by winners. But he was apparently a prisoner of war of Greek ancestry who ended up in a gladiator training school in Capua, south of Rome. 
One day, he and 70 other gladiators seized kitchen utensils and revolted. They then fled to Mount Vesuvius, which is a big volcano near Naples and Pompeii. And there, around that area, they began to attract more and more followers who ran away until Spartacus was at the head of a group of several dozen thousand runaway slaves, a whole army. The Romans sent some forces against Spartacus, but they were defeated one after the other after the other, uh, in part because Romans looked down upon slaves and they didn't take the necessary precautions, like building a camp at night. But as you know, the Romans didn't quit, and they kept sending more armies. So Spartacus tried to leave the Italian peninsula by going north through the Alps, and then later on hiring private ships to escape south through the sea, uh, but both of these came to naught. So he was trapped in Italy. And the Romans eventually appointed the richest man in Rome, Crassus, uh, to finish off Spartacus. And Crassus began by decimating his own troops, uh, which means that when Roman generals thought that their men had been guilty of cowardice, they would select one out of ten at random. That's what decimation means, one tenth. And then they would kill them in view of the other, their own troops which is quite cruel, but apparently was enough to boost the army's willingness to fight, uh, according to Crassus. So because it was trapped in Italy, Spartacus decided to fight one last big battle against Crassus, though unfortunately he lost it. Spartacus apparently died in that battle, but 6,000 of his followers were taken alive and cruelly crucified one by one along the Via Appia, all the way from the battle site to the gates of Rome, as a grim warning against all the slaves. So Spartacus was defeated for good. In fact, that was the last major slave revolt in Roman history. But he achieved more fame in death than Crassus ever did. He became a hero to many. I studied the Haitian Revolution in the 18th century, and many leaders of that slave revolt dreamed of becoming the black Spartacus in his honor. Spartacus was also a personal hero of Karl Marx, a communist philosopher, because Spartacus was a worker who had stood up against the rich. And there was even a group of German communists after World War I who called themselves the Spartacus. Uh, Spartacus was also the personal hero of the actor Kirk Douglas after World War II, and Kirk Douglas was Jewish, so he associated Spartacus with the Jews' own struggle against bondage in Egypt. And Kirk Douglas starred in the 1950s epic Spartacus, which I highly recommend uh, that you watch. It's a Stanley Kubrick movie. And then if you search for the dark corner of the internet, you may encounter a gay magazine called Spartacus. Apparently there's something attractive about muscular, well-oiled, half-clad young men. So the point I'm making is that uh, so little is known about Spartacus that everyone, whether you're Jewish or gay or communist or a black slave in Haiti, everyone has been able to project their own fantasies onto the life of Spartacus. It's like a Rorschach test. Well, uh, that's a lot to digest, so I'll stop here today, and I'll also stop this section right here. Uh, antiquity is over. Next time we'll start a whole new section on ancient religions, from Confucianism to Hinduism to Christianity and beyond. But for now, that's it. Goodbye. Au revoir.